Hello, everyone. My name is Manal Sharif, and I'm from Saudi Arabia. I'd like to talk about two chapters in my life. I'll start with chapter one. Chapter one in my life tells the story of my generation, and it starts with the year I was born in. That was 1979. In 1979, there was a siege of Mecca. Mecca is the holiest shrine for Muslims in the world. It was seized by Jehaman, a militant, and some 400 men. The siege stayed for two weeks. The Saudi authorities had to use armed force, heavily armed force, to end the siege and they had to be hidden, Jehaman and his men, publicly. After that event, the Saudi authorities were very anxious of the uprising of militants and extremists. Saudi Arabia is very, at that time, at 1979, was newly formed and was rapidly changing and adopting the civil new life. Those extremists, that was against their beliefs, so they wanted to stop this. So Saudi authorities had to abide by that. To prevent another uprising, they quickly moved to roll back the immoral liberties that had been tolerated in previous years. Just like Jehaman, those extremists had long been upset with the gradual loosening of restrictions on women. In the weeks after Mecca uprising, female announcers were removed from TV. Pictures of women in printings were banned. Employment of women was narrowed to two things, education and health care. Music was banned. Cinemas were closed. Separation between genders was strictly enforced everywhere, from public places, government offices, banks, schools, even to our own houses. So each house in Saudi has two entrances, one for men and one for women. Petrodollars poured into these extremist budgets. They used it to spread religious education and missionary organizations around the world, many of which preach hatred of the infidel, dedication to global jihad, and rejection of anyone who does not share the same ideals. The Committee to Promote Virtue and Prevent Vice, or the Religious Police, was also given a free hand in society. They beheaded a monster, but enshrined his ideology of hate. Saudi authorities try their best to make the story of Jehaman forgotten. So they remove all articles and reports from magazines and newspapers, and so people forget about Jehaman. I remember one day, it was Hajj time, and this is Kaaba, which is the holy shrine for Muslims. They lift the curtains up so you can see the walls. I was performing tawaf with my mother, where you have to walk in circle around the Kaaba. There was a hole in that wall. And mom pointed to it and she said, that's a hole from the time, from a bullet, from the time of Jehaman. Jehaman was the name that brings terror to people of Mecca and Muslims around the world. For me, that hole went beyond these walls. It went in time. It was like a hole that we fell in, and we kept going backward in my country. So the 80s and the years after, there was Afghan war and the Soviet Union. The new extremists were very powerful, promoting their ideas and enforcing everyone to abide by their strict rules. Free leaflets, books, cassettes, calling for jihad in Afghanistan, and calling to dismiss any non-Muslim from the Arabian Peninsula were giving freely. I used to one of the people who distributed these leaflets. A 22-year-old man was amongst those fighters. His name was Osama bin Laden. Those fighters at that time were our heroes. Women in Sahwa time, or in the 80s. In the Sahwa time, those extremists, one of the main 
subject they used to talk about is us women. For them, a woman is always treated like the seductive fruit. Means, if I leave the house and something bad happens, I'm responsible for that, because men cannot control their instincts. So I, had to, I was bound to stay home, according to their rules. For them, I was awra. Awra is sinful place of your body to show or to disclose. For them, my face was awra. Even my voice was awra. My name was awra. Women cannot be called with their name, so they're called mother of her, one of her sons or wife of the man's name. There were no sports, there were no engineering schools for women, there were, of course, no driving. We didn't even have IDs with our pictures, except the passport that when we leave the country. So we were voiceless, we were faceless, and we were nameless, we were just invisible. Something happened at that time, in 1990, it was November 6, where 47 courageous women they challenged the ban on women driving, and they drove in Riyadh. Those women were detained, banned from leaving the country, dismissed from their jobs. They stole their lives. I remember when I was a kid and we received the news. They told us those women are really bad. A fatwa came from the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh bin Baz, and he said women driving is banned in Islam. And based on that, an announcer came on TV and he said, the Ministry of Interior warns everyone in this country that women are not allowed to drive in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Later on, we're not supposed to talk about women driving, whether in TV or reports, or in magazines or newspapers. So another taboo was created. The first taboo was Jehaman, and the second taboo was women driving. Something also in my first chapter of my life happened. There was the bombing of Khobar Tower. They were bombed on June 25, 1996. And according to the Saudi government, the attack was carried out by Saudi Islamic militants, including many veterans of the Afghan war. 19 US Air Force personnel and one Saudi were killed, and 372 people were injured that day. I remember my mother when she saw this picture, she gasped, and she said, Jehman is back. I'm surprised to remember at that time, I was only 17, but I did not sympathize with the death. I was brainwashed, I was brought up, I was a project of a terrorist at that time. The change in my life started happening in the year 2000. So the year 2000, the internet was introduced to Saudi Arabia. That was the first time for me to go online. And I'll explain why I'm displaying this picture. I was really extremist, so I used to cover top to head. Uh, they told us in school, it's sinful to draw people or portraits of animals or people. And I took all my paintings and I burned them. And I was burning inside and feeling this is so unfair. In the year 2000, when the internet was introduced to Saudi Arabia, it was the first door for us the youth, the young people, to the outside world. I started, I was very thirsty to learn about other culture, about, about other religions. I started to talk to people with different opinions than me. And questions started to raise in my head at that time. I realized at that time how small the box I was in when I stepped out of it. I started slowly losing my phobia of getting my pure beliefs polluted. Let me tell you another story in my life. Do you remember the first time you listened to music? To me, more specific, do you remember the first song you ever listened to? I remember. I was 21 years old. It was the first time in my life I allowed myself to listen to music. And I remember the song. It was Show Me the Meaning of Being Lonely by Backstreet Boys. <laughs> to understand 
I used to burn my brother's music cassettes in the oven. Sorry, brother. I was that extreme. And when I listened to this song, they've been telling us music is Satan's flute, is a path to adultery. This song sounded so pure, so beautiful, so angelic. It can be anything but evil to me. And that day I realized how lonely I was in the world I isolated myself in. A turning point in my life also was 9-11. And I think it was a turning point in so many people of my generation. When 9-11 happened, the extremists said, it's God's punishment to America for what they're doing to Muslims. I was confused which side to take. I watched the news that night, and I saw this picture. It was a video of a man throwing himself from one of these towers. He was escaping the fire. I remember that night I couldn't sleep. That picture of that man throwing himself was in my head and it was ringing a bell. Something is wrong. There is no religion on earth can accept such merciless, such cruelness. Al-Qaeda later, they announced they're responsible for these attacks. My heroes were nothing but bloody terrorists. And that was the turning point in my life. After 9-11, Saudi Arabia faced a sweep of terrorist attacks in our land. Very interesting thing. Few months after 9-11, they started for the first time issuing us IDs, women. For the first time, they recognized us as citizens in our own country. Now I will move to chapter two in my life, which I think everyone here heard about striving for freedom. Maybe there is a gap between chapter one and chapter two. Saudi Arabia, there is not that much happening, so maybe there is not that much to tell you what happened from chapter one to two. But chapter two, we were inspired by the Arab Spring, and we were led by personal struggles. We were a group of women, Saudi women, who started drive your own life, and it was just a very simple campaign using social media and calling women to drive on June 17. One of the breakthrough things, I recorded a video explaining what is June 17, and I recorded another video of me driving. I used my face, my voice, and my real name. I was there to speak up for myself. I used to be ashamed of who I am, a woman, but not anymore. That video, when I posted it online, it got like 700,000 views in one day. A day later, I was arrested and sent to jail. And there was this riot around the country, and people were divided into two parties. So a party calling for my trial, even flagging me in a public place. Facebook page is showing, saying that men will hit women with their riqal, and it's like a robe men wear on top of their head. And women replied back saying, we'll throw shoes in you, <laughs> or shoes in you, if you hit us on June 17. So it was just like a fight between the two. But what really, which I didn't know about until I left, until I was released from jail, was all these people who were inspired by a very simple individual story of something every one of us does every day. It was something inspired so many people around the world and created a rally that led to my release nine days later. When I left jail, lots of rumors, lots of harsh things happened in my life. I was, it was the hardest thing, not facing what I did. It was just facing those things I did not do. On June 17, the day we called for women to drive, some hundred brave women 
Despite all the streets, they were packed with police cars, traffic police cars, even religious police SUVs in every corner, terrorizing any woman to just go and drive that day. Some hundred women drove that day. None was arrested. We broke women driving taboo. I met Muna in January in Egypt, and she said, what's your secret? And I told her, Muna, they messed up with the wrong woman. <laughs> and she used it in the speech that night. And I say that what I feel is I measure the impact I make by how harsh the attacks are. The harsher the attacks were, the greater the impact was. Is that as simple? We started now a movement inside Arabia, women. We call it the Saudi Women's Spring. And my group is My Right to Dignity. And we believe in full citizenship for women because the child cannot be free if his mother is not free. The husband cannot be free if his wife is not free. The parents are not free if their daughters are not free. The society is nothing if the women are nothing. Freedom starts within. For me, here, I am free. But when I go back home to Saudi Arabia, the struggle just began. I don't know how long it will last, and I don't know when it will end. But for me, the struggle is not about driving a car. It's about being in the driver's seat of our destiny. It's to be free, not only to dream, but also to live. Thank you.